Welcome back, all you beautiful souls, to another episode of Aligned and Alive. I'm your host, Chrissy May, and today I have an incredible guest who has 15 years of experience in the personal development industry and has successfully transformed the lives of over 100,000 clients. While working with his late mentor, Bob Proctor, he was the man behind the eight-figure sales system generating over $100 million in revenue. He is the creator of the Millionaire Mastermind, the host of Seven Figure Standard Podcast, author of The World Class Wealth Mindset, and the president and co-founder of Voss Coaching Co. It is a pleasure to sit and share in conversation today with Arash Vasuki. It's great to be here. Thank you for being here. So last time I saw you, you were at Method Athlete with Casey, really getting your workout on. <laughs> we both love Casey. Oh my gosh. Now, are you still in hardcore training these days? Are you still yeah. working out a lot? Yeah. Four days a week with Casey. So we're really getting after it. Which goes hand in hand with mindset and everything else, right? I mean, that's important. Everything is mindset. 95% of success is mindset, 5% is strategy. Yet most people won't accept that idea. And mindset is so interesting because it's been so polarized. But if you ask somebody what mindset is, what do, what do you think they would tell you? I don't know. Their monkey mind is what they're thinking upstairs. Yeah. We want to define it. The more specific we understand it, then we could leverage our mindset and success happens by default. So then how do you do that? How do you get, well, before we get into that, because there's so much to talk about, I know you have a wealth of information to provide. I would love to hear your story on how you even got to this place, how you got to, you know, growing this massive company with Bob Proctor, the late Bob Proctor, how you've been able to go from failure to success and, and just kind of give us a glimpse, a little peek at the younger Arash, if you would. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> You know, my story, people ask me all the time, did you know you were going to do this? And I did not. I grew up in California, in San Jose. I came out to where I live now in Scottsdale, Arizona. I went to Arizona State. But I was just an average student. Like, C's were really pushing it. I just loved the social part of college. Well, as you grow older, I started in the corporate world. And... It wasn't fulfilling to me. And I, I started getting into personal development. And I remember the first thing I ever watched was a Wayne Dyer PBS, Power of Intention. I don't know where this thought came from. I said, I can do what he's doing. And then I didn't believe it. I just let it go. And I just started falling in love with all the philosophies. And I thought back when I was at Arizona State, my favorite class was psychology but it was sports psychology because I'm a huge sports fan. I was earning a low six-figure income. I took myself from the bottom to the top of that company in the corporate world, and I started really getting into personal development. I read over 300 books in a year, and I just wanted... The idea of freedom was my idea that I fell in love with. Uh, but I had this plan that I was going to coach people. Um, but I said, when I outperform my current income in coaching, then I'll leave. Well, the universe had other plans. <laughs> so what happened for me is my company sold. Uh, the new company wanted to keep me. But I thought I was studying this at that time pretty avidly for three years. And I said, this is your chance. And I'll tell you what really changed it for me. The only person in the company that I reported to was the president of the company. And there was these rumors that they were going to sell. So I said, I asked him, are you guys going to sell? And he said, he said, no, you'd be one of the first to know. The very next day they sold. And I'm walking in the parking lot. It's back to my car. I'm getting married three weeks later. And I was mad. Then a voice came and said, you should be mad at you you've been studying this, why don't you put it to action? And almost immediately my philosophy changed. But at that time I come home, and this is no joke, because um, I didn't do a good job of managing money. I was 150,000 in debt, had a foreclosure sticker on my garage. It was this big orange sticker, which was super embarrassing. 
my fiance at the time, my wife, now, I said, I'm not going to accept their offer. And she said, well, what are, we, what are we going to do? I said, I'll figure it out. I just knew this was my time to do it. I'd rather fail doing it than keep going in the same way. I would have still earned 100000 but it would have been the same. I still would have been unfulfilled. Well, a couple days later, my mentor, Bob Proctor, and I had a mutual acquaintance, and they connected us. And he said to me, he said, well, what is it that you want? And I said, I'm not really sure. I said, I want to create a life of freedom. Then he interrupted me, and he said, you do what, know what you want. And he said, how serious are you? And I said, I'm very serious because I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And he said, that's a good start. He said, will you do exactly what I tell you? And I said, probably not. I've never done exactly what anyone tells me. He said, for me to show you how to create freedom, you're going to have to develop discipline. I said, I have terrible discipline. I'm a great starter and a terrible finisher. And he started laughing. He said, you sound like me, how I used to be. And he said, if you will do exactly what I tell you for one year, your whole life will change. I was in so much debt. I didn't know how many thousands it was going to cost, but I knew I had to do it. And I thought to myself, what's the difference? 150, 100, what's an extra 10, 20,000? But I literally did exactly what he told me. And within three months, everything changed. I know it sounds crazy, but for me, everything changed where I didn't take the new job. I bet on myself, and that's a key thing that really transformed me was betting on myself. And I went from zero to 10,000 a month. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it gave me belief and it gave me hope. And I think hope is what kept my action going. And within seven months, I was earning 25,000 a month. Within a year, 32,000 a month. And then within two years, I earned my first million. My goal was never a million. It was just to be free. I wanted to do what I wanted, with whom I wanted, as often as I wanted. Freedom was the idea I fell in love with. And I've always been an underdog though. You know, growing up, I played sports and I was always the smallest, but I'd always go against the biggest kids and I was fearless. And I think that's what transformed in me in my adult life when I bet on myself. Until I bet on myself, I was very mediocre, very average. I tolerated too much mediocrity, in my opinion, looking back. Um, but then Bob and I, Bob took a liking to me and he asked me to partner up with him and he said, I want you to be my vice president of sales and run our sales division. What year was this? This was in 2010. Okay. Uh, 2010. And I said, well, what are we selling? And <laughs> the funny thing is, if you asked him his programs, he didn't do a great job of <laughs> explaining it. So I said, forget it. I'll figure it out. And um, he's definitely the best teacher in the world. He was the best teacher in the world. He was a great mentor and a great friend. He was... He was like a second father to me, but him and I just connected and we were at each other's hip until the very end, until he recently passed. But during that time, I told him, you've got to let me, because I saw how they were running it. And I've been on the other side of coaching people and selling them into a program and everything was fear-based. And I said, you've got to let me do it my way. The results always tell the truth. So he said, if that'll happen, I will let you do it your way. And we did, and we created so much success for other people. And then once he passed, I would have been with him another 20 years. I was so loyal to him. But once he passed, it was time for me to go because I outgrew the environment. And I have a core principle. Once you outgrow an environment, you have to leave. And once I left, I created my own company. We, in our first year, we did close to eight figures. Um, we're helping people in, I don't know how many, I think 60 countries last year. Wow. Uh, so, but I've had so much experience. You've got to understand, I have 17 years now of experience coaching people. And it's been, a, it's been an absolute boss. We were talking about it before <laughs> we started. I think this helping people, everyone helps people in a certain way. But when you can help somebody wake up and reach their potential, there's nothing better. No better feeling. It really isn't. No. I'm curious, what was it? Because you mentioned going, being so deep in debt. What did Bob tell you in those beginning months that 
had you go from zero to 10,000 in the first three months? Well, the first thing I did, I changed my philosophy. I stopped focusing on the debt. Uh -huh. And I did that before Bob told me because I was drowning in it. And I said, I can't do anything about what's happened, but I can do something about what I do going forward. And then he told me that. And so all I put my attention on was freedom. And I remember writing out every day, how can I? I would write mm -hmm. the question, how can I? How can I earn X? And then the first was 10,000 a month. Then it kept going to 25, then 50 a month, then 100 a month. Same thing, but I was building a prosperity consciousness. You see, money's an interesting thing. You have to understand the rules of money if you're gonna earn it. And you wanna make money your friend. So I shifted it and I healed my money wounds. It wasn't by accident that I was 150,000 in debt. And until I healed my money wounds, I couldn't attract money into my life because I didn't understand it. And so I started just learning the philosophy. And philosophy is such an interesting thing because, but philosophy changed my life. Philosophy is our automatic way of thinking. So you can watch anybody and you'll pick up their automatic thinking by listening to their language. If you and I were spending 24 hours together, I'd know what you're creating over the next year. You'll know what I'm creating over the next year because our day, I love this quote by Robin Sharma. He says, your day is your year in miniature. And I just started getting so good in my days. I just started winning my days and you keep stacking day after day and they don't have to be perfect, but your intent, intent has to be perfect. So good, all of that. Yeah. And I truly believe that. So then for someone who is kind of new to the game, you know, other season, you know, coming in, what would you recommend for them to start flipping the script? Because when you're so knee deep in debt, it's very difficult just automatically to say, oh, there's $150,000 in mm -hmm. debt. Let's just push it aside and just start thinking happy thoughts. Because, right. you know, for someone who doesn't understand that process, if you could just bring it down a little bit more tangible, actionable steps that they could take to start shifting in that direction, what does that look like? What does that roadmap look like for the next, say, 30, 60 days out? Well, the first thing you want to do is you, you said the word is the answer, which was script. Mm -hmm. You want to write a script of your life a year from now. You've got to fall in love with your future. If you don't have a great, if you are not looking forward to your future, you're not going to be motivated. You're not going to create much in the present. So what I advise all my clients to do, if you were a new client, there's two things that I would do. The fir first two things I work with every client. Number one is I have them write a script of their life in the present tense, exactly how they want it to be in all areas of their life. But I don't just have them write it. I have them record it and listen to it 10 minutes a day because we have to rewire the programming. The second thing I do is I set up a morning routine. If you win your morning, you're gonna win your day. And if you look back, or if I look back, I could share it with you, like why did I start winning when I was losing so bad? I started conquering myself. Hmm. Until I conquered myself, I was gonna do the same thing. A lot of people want change, but then they, they keep doing the same action steps. They keep hoping for change. That's not how change is created. Change is created by design in doing the deep internal work and transforming your past. Because if we're bringing our past into the present, that's what's gonna be in the future. But when we transform our past, we're transforming our future. Right. And I like that you mentioned, like, I think it really is doing hard stuff, like doing the stuff you don't want to do or want to face, but we all know what that is at the end of the day. If we have some sort of honesty and mm -hmm. self-awareness, we're like, okay, maybe I should put down that bag of chips. Maybe I should start mm -hmm. going to the gym or taking a walk every day, right? Making better decisions that that 1% daily that's going to stack over time. And before you know it, you are literally on your way to becoming a, an entirely different person. And do you think that's where most people fail is that they just can't even show up and begin taking action towards that difficult task at hand? I think why most people fail a couple reasons. Number one, they don't have a goal. Number two, they don't believe it's possible. They're letting their past dictate their future. Uh, so I could take a person and I'd say, because uh, I get this a lot when I'm working with my clients, they say, well, I've had this goal before, but I've never achieved it. 
And then I start asking him questions because questions will open you up. And I say, let me ask you this. Did you have an all-in commitment at your future self when you were going after that goal? They say, no. I say, did you make an irrevocable committed decision? Like no shit, no kidding. This is what I'm doing. No. Did you take that first action, action step to get started? No. I said, you're not comparing apples to apples. So the first thing we have to do and understand why are people stuck? They're seeing themselves where they currently are, not where they want to go. Wherever we see ourselves is the direction we're facing. So I always give the example when I'm going to the gym. If I don't have any idea where the gym is, I could end up at the gas station. Yet we do it so easily that we know, hey, I'm going here. And we have an image in our mind where we're going. Well, it's the same thing with our goals. Every single person can win extraordinarily big. But they have to make that first step. They have, and the first step is making a decision that I want more. But here's the challenge. Every time we're going after something bigger, the old program, the minute you aspire for something greater, the old program is going to try to keep you small. It gets you to rationalize. And every time you're rationalizing, you're not coming from your desire. You're coming from your current self. I couldn't agree more with that. And I'm thinking right now as you're speaking on self-sabotage, how that's so common. And I know I've experienced a lot in my life. I know when I started off as a fitness competitor in my 20s, I started seeing all these big contracts coming in. And then before I knew it, I was choosing to slip back into comfort because I almost didn't know how, or maybe I didn't think I was worthy at the time to mm -hmm. align with that kind of success. So I find that to be really interesting. Do you feel that, at least coming from a different perspective, that self-love really does play a pivotal point in someone's success? For instance, you will only keep aspiring to what you feel, how much you love yourself, what you think you're worthy of. I mean, how it's not just desire and mindset of, I want that big life, but also internally, what yeah, aligning with that same Well, concept. worthiness is huge, and most people yeah. run away from it. They bury it, but you will never attract what you don't feel worthy of. I went two years of the worst time in my life when I worked on self-love. It was the most painful time. <laughs> uh, it was, but now I look at it, I was so lonely at that time, but I went through two years. All I did was work on worthiness. I work on worthiness every day because I know if I don't feel worthy of it, I'm not going to have it in my life. Uh, so self-love is critical. And I always talk to men about this because men have a harder time accepting it. And I believe your greatest strength is when you're the most vulnerable. And we've got to start feeling. You see, I've never seen a time that it's easier to win than now. Why? Because how many people do you know that exude excellence? 0.0001%, like right. if that. Yeah. How many people do you know that bet on themselves every day? They have that unbelievable amount of self-confidence. Very few. Very few. So that's the outlier. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so easy to win because we're, we're in a time right now where there's more victims than there has ever been. So if you take ownership, I'm the problem, and I'm the only solution, you're going to be so much further ahead than the marketplace. And that's why I think it's so easy to win. But we have to do that. We have to do hard better. We have to look at our insecurities and stop looking at them. They're a bad thing. My greatest insecurities have gifted me my greatest wins because I, I dealt with them I, one at a time. We all have insecurities. We're never just there. You know, this thing about destination is so interesting to me because it's not a destination. I thought it was when I was first starting. I go, if I get a hold of my finances, then I'll be it. Well, I got a hold of them, but I wanted more because then it's like a drug. It's like you want to see how far you could take this. But the journey is what we have to commit to. And the journey is hard. But if you do that deep internal work, if you do journaling, if you hire a mentor, if you do study yourself, that was the big one is studying yourself. Because once I studied myself, I realized what it wasn't just the sabotaging behaviors. What were the thinking pattern behind those sabotaging behaviors? So I found out my story. I'll tell you this, Chrissy, if I was starting over 17 years ago and I just picked up the first book, the 
only thing that I would work on for at least 18 months would be my identity. Mm. If I was doing it over, I, was, I wasn't doing it right when I first got, got this information. I was doing too many things. But it all comes down to identity because you can never outperform your identity. So that's what I would have made as my strongest foundation in the beginning. I like that. And I'd have to agree 100%. Even, I mean, we get wrapped up into uh, societal programming and even programming from childhood that carries over. And really do people sit just like self-inquiry mm-hmm. and really just sit there and go, huh, why do I do what I do? Where did I learn that? You know, is it me or is it an external force that's triggering me to think that's me? You know, I mean, we can go real deep with it, but I love that you mentioned that because I don't think people talk enough about that. It's more of read this book mm-hmm. and then you'll be this amazing new person. And it doesn't necessarily work like that. You know, I'll give you a story that like totally opened me up. Uh, I'm thinking about what you're saying because I Mm -hmm. read the books. I was on YouTube. I went to seminars. I spent thousands and thousands of of dollars and created no results. Then I met my mentor and I said, oh, I've studied this and this. He said, you don't know this. You know about it. He said, all I have to do is look at your results. I said, son of a bitch is right. (laughs) I was like, and then that's when I realized I didn't know how to study. And he, I said, well, how do you study? And he said, I don't read books. I read paragraphs. So he taught me how to study. So now, like, if I'm studying a book, I'll study one to three paragraphs, but I'll read it five times a day. And I want to become every word of those paragraphs that I'm studying. So I make it a part of my identity. See, you know what's a part of If you want to look at somebody's identity, if anyone's, whoever's listening to this, if you're sitting there saying, Well, I don't know my identity. I'll give you three cues. Number one, look at your results. Number two, watch your behaviors for a few days. Your behaviors always reflect your identity. And number three, watch your commitments. Mm. Uh, So we've got to shed the old identity. And how you do it is building a significant personal standard. Your standard is your DNA to success. It's your foundation. What happens is you have to have a vision. You have to know how do I want to live? Your vision creates your philosophy, so you got to start thinking like that person. Your philosophy creates your standard. Your standard creates your story. Your story creates your identity, and the identity creates the results. And there you go. Did you guys all get that? (laughs) I mean, it's really that simple. Uh, Now, is that uh, outlined in your book, just that clearly as well? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we haven't even... I mean, look at this. Look at this amazing book that Arash just completed not too long ago. Pre-order is March what? It's pre-orders available now. It's going to be March 12th is the release date. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. The world-class wealth mindset, four pillars to building personal freedom. Who does not want that? Who doesn't need that? Yeah. I mean, think about that. This is incredible. So do you outline that in this book as well as far as what you just discussed? The book, I deconstructed everything that I did and that I continue to do that took me from being six figures in debt to creating multiple seven figures and creating an eight figure business. Success is not hard. It's a few disciplines compounded over time. Yet people think they can do it. She can do it, but I can't, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is the rule you want to understand. If one person can be free, anybody can be free. If one person can be wealthy, anybody can be wealthy. We have to start understanding who we are. We have infinite inside of us. I don't have more infinite than you. You don't have it more than we. We've all been gifted the infiniteness by whatever you believe in. And I believe in God, so my creator is inside of me. And every time you shrink, you're not operating from your infiniteness. You're operating from the masses. And if you continue following the masses, I call, this is the truth, the, the, what I call it. I say anyone who's call, following the masses, they're following the asses. Yeah, that's and, good. and because how many people in the masses are making big things happen? You have a top 3% that make things happen. Really top one now, because the top 3% is not even it anymore. It's that top 1%, but you have it inside of you. But you have to understand that you have infinite potential. Right now, everything that's is, that has happened in your life, my life, in your life, Chrissy, has prepared us for what we're about to do. That means the failures, the successes, the times we didn't take the actions, the time we negotiated with ourselves. Everything 
is just about what we get to do going forward. I like that you said that, negotiating with ourselves. How many times do we all sit in negotiations day after day? Gosh, that's so, that's so good. I've never heard someone say that. Negotiation is the biggest self-sabotager. Mm -hmm. Out of any of the sabotager, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. Then the alarm goes on. Nope, didn't get up. I'm going to go to the gym. Nope. I'm going to get out of my comfort zone. And they don't do it. And so when we are talking about self-love, the greatest form of self-love is never negotiating with ourselves. Discipline is self-love. Think about when you, when you say you're going to do something, you do it. That's all discipline is. I think one of the best things that I learned when I was not winning to what created winning was I created discipline. But I used to think discipline was doing the activities. That's not the discipline. That's the effect. Discipline is accepting and rejecting ideas that are in harmony with the person you want to become. And that's what creates discipline. The activities happen by default. It's just the effect. I'm smiling so big right now because I just did a podcast episode on this. The exact mm -hmm. same thing you're saying right now. I was, um, if you ever heard of Charles Poliquin, he was Casey and I's trainer for a long time. Okay. Strength, Olympic strength and conditioning coach, uh, the late Charles Poliquin. He talked about that. He said, there is no such thing as discipline. It's, there's only love. And it comes down to what do you love the most? And then he goes on to saying about self-love. You know, do you sit down at a restaurant and pass on the hot buttery mm -hmm. rolls, you know, and ask to ask for, you know, maybe lemons in your water? You know, how much do you love yourself mm -hmm. to give yourself that next level of experience that we, we're all not only deserving of, but there's no separation in that. It's not separate from me to you. We all have the opportunity to open ourselves up to receive that. It comes down to how much do you truly love yourself, not are you disciplined? Well, you look at that. I agree with that 100%, but you look at it, it goes back to self-love. Yeah. You know, when we fall in love with ourselves, that's when life becomes magical. And until we fall in love with ourselves, and I don't mean that from an arrogant standpoint, I mean it from an understanding, uh, that's when you're at your best. And if anybody thinks, think of a time that you were in super flow. You were not thinking, you were instinctual, and you were just being. Well, we've got to get out of overthinking. And when people say, like I did, I didn't understand it. So I was overcomplicating it. And complexity is the enemy of execution. We want to simplify everything, make it bulletproof it in our favor. And that's how discipline gets created, but that's how your results get created. And wouldn't you agree the circle you hang out with, your circle of influence, your environment, I feel like is the most, one of the most important parts of it. You can't change you until you change your environment. Yeah. Uh, there's a great book called Connections. And there's this research done uh, that says you're, you're not just connected to the five closest people to you, you're connected to their five and their five. So right now you and I are connected. So I'm connected to your five right now and you're connected to my five. And then it goes down three layers. But there is no change without hope first. Hope gives us options. If you don't have hope, you're not gonna do the disciplines. You're not gonna set goals. See, a lot of people don't even understand the power of goals. Everything is driven by the goal. Your future self is from the person who already achieved the goal. But we don't just want to have a goal. We have to turn the goal into a desire. Until it's a desire, it's still in our conscious mind. Mm -hmm. And your subconscious mind creates 96 to 98% of all your results, perceptions, and behavior. But when I was reading all that book, I was just gathering information. It was just in my conscious mind. But when we plant the goal and dump it in our subconscious mind, then the whole universe conspires on your behalf to make it a reality. But if it's in my conscious mind, it's not going to go anywhere. So along that thought, have you done any sort of hypnosis or NLP work to help, yeah, help make I, that process I, easier? You know, it's so funny. I did unconsciously. I didn't know I was doing <laughs> it. But I remember I used to go to sleep. I had this sleep pillow when I wasn't succeeding. And I would listen to affirmations over and over again. It drove me crazy because even though I had it slightly, I still couldn't sleep. But I was doing 
neurolinguistic programming, but I didn't know I was doing it. Um, now I have a formula of exactly what to do, of how to get a belief installed. What is that? Uh, auto I love to learn it because I'm always up uh, yeah. to something new and different. It's it's a <laughs> there's two things. There's auto suggestion, which is a suggestion from yourself to yourself, but. What I, I do for myself and I, all my elite clients do this is number one, you have your goal. Let's say somebody wants to turn, let's say they're earning 100,000 a year. They want to turn it into a million. So you auto suggest something similar to this. I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm earning 100,000 a month and I love it. And I'm happy, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy. It is done. Mm -hmm. But then you repeat that with emotion. Every three hours for two minutes. Three hours for two Every minutes. three hours. I have them literally put an alarm on their phone. Uh, but most people won't do it. They say they want it, but they won't do it. But the ones that do it, within 30, 60, 90 days, they've accepted that idea. Then number two is mental rehearsing. Where you're seeing yourself, I'm going to use the same example. You're seeing yourself of what you would see that you're earning a million now. What would you experience? And you see it in your mind like it's already here. What would you hear? What would your close friends tell you? They're congratulating you. Oh my God, Chrissy, it's so inspirational what, you do, what you've done. I'm watching you, it's unreal. The plane's taking off a Scottsdale yeah, that, airport. That's you a, feel it right now, the engine's revving. Yeah, and then feel <laughs> the leather in the plane. Yeah. So you do this every three hours mm -hmm. for one minute after you do the auto-suggesting. And that is how you're reprogramming yourself. We've got to understand our current program is running 95% of our day. So my day, unless I consciously want to create a new part of that program and I'm willing to put in the discipline, it's on autopilot, 95%. So really, at the end of the day, it comes down to being super intentional, like massive intentionality is what it comes down to. Yes, it's yeah. all, everything you do has to be purposeful. Mm -hmm. And intention is frequency of thought. But thought is a currency. So when we're thinking and lacking limitation, we're literally flushing our future down the toilet. And I'm being honest, I'm being very, I'm being very direct about it because this isn't about positive thinking. This is about accurate thinking. If you watch what you're thinking about, you'll know why you've created what you're doing because the thoughts create the feelings, the feelings create the actions, and the actions create the results. Truth. So then how does someone get out of their monkey mind when they find themselves in that trap of, you know, I mean, it happens to all of us, right? Mm -hmm. So like, what is your go-to thing to snap yourself out of it when you, you, you probably mm -hmm. never go there, but if you do find yourself going down that slippery slope, no, I still go there from time to time. Okay. The old program still tries to mm -hmm. come in. You've literally got to get a PhD in accepting and rejecting ideas. See, we have thought energy coming in and through us within a couple seconds. And we're either choosing the positive or the negative side. But let's say using that example of somebody who earns a million, the thought comes in, can I really do this? Reject. If one person can do it, anyone can do it. Mm. And so you've got to talk to your programming, that voice inside of you. It's a bully. It's a con man or con woman. And how do you deal with a bully? You stand up to him. So anytime I'm aspiring to do something greater and the voice comes in, I said, get out of here. I said, I've done it your way my whole life. All I know is this is what I'm doing and I am willing. See, if we go back to goals, Underneath the goal, it has to be a want first. What do you really want more than anything else in the world? But most people are focusing on too many wants. So we've got to focus on the one want that means the most to us this year, in 2024. And now we've got to turn that into a desire. Uh, we don't want to keep it in the wanting state because if we're in the wanting state, we're going to keep creating everything to keep us wanting it. So we're separate from the goal. We've got to turn it into a desire and we become one with it. And then all day long, we think, feel, and act like that person. That means we get out of our comfort zone. See, you and I could do the same action step every day though, do it 1% better, it's a different action step. 1% mm -hmm. more intentional. Operate with 1% greater standard of it and it's not the same action step. So it's not just doing things, it's doing things in a certain way. Right. This is so good. 
I'd like to circle back to what you just mentioned regarding um, having almost like being a bully with the, with the thoughts that arise in us that aren't serving us. And it made me think of even just in relationships in general, how to navigate that whole spectrum. It's so difficult sometimes if you have one person that is guided in this positive visionary, you know, this is where I want to go and this other person's not. It almost made me see like a spouse that comes in and wants to like dump their dirty laundry on the carpet and be like, no, yeah. <laughs> like I am in my zone of genius and I'm going here. So how do you touch on that with specifically couples that live together? Because that's a whole totally different animal than just friendships or family and stuff like that. Yeah, th this happens quite frequently. One person wants to grow. The other person wants to stay where they're at. And the other person will try to bring them down because they're afraid of the other person outgrowing them. But you have to communicate eff effectively. This is our own race. And if you don't communicate effectively with your spouse or with your partner, you're going to have a lot of double binding messages going throughout the days. And it's going to stunt your growth. So, you know, I always say when I was first getting in this work, I never forced it on my wife. Um, because I knew that wasn't a winning formula for our relationship. But we always joke now that she learned it through osmosis. So, uh, so I think the I like best that. way to live is by example. And the people, I had people talking behind my back like you wouldn't believe. It. My close friends, family mem members. I had my mom and my brother early on, and they thought I was studying to be a priest. Not that there's anything wrong with being a priest, but... Um, they didn't understand, but you have to get this attitude really, to, if you want to succeed, if you want to live your race effortlessly, you can't worry about what other people are thinking. People are suffering because they're so worried about what the other person is thinking. I used to be that person. I used to always worry about what they were thinking. I'd let everybody's opinion control mine, um, but that's why I was losing. So then how did you shift out of that? Was it a pivotal moment you can recall that it was some people it's, you know, when you get older, you start really realizing yeah. like, oh, life is super short. So let's just do this, you know? So was there something that? I, I think it's just awareness, yeah. awareness and understanding. But, you know, there's a concept uh, that I teach that you have to develop and I don't give enough attitude. And it's such a powerful one. And it isn't because you think you're better. But you're saying this, I'm not doing this. I'm not dealing with a suggestion is one of the most powerful forms in the universe. It, the most powerful forces in the universe. We're getting marketed to, to with suggestion all the time. Yet people are letting other people's limiting beliefs get inside of them because they don't reject. That's why I said accepting and rejecting in a partnership is so important. But the best way is to get aligned of where you want, how you want to live. And most partners do never, never talk about that. And you have to communicate that. So we're going in the same direction. That's why you see so many people get divorced and they're not aligned anymore. And if you're not aligned, one's going to outgrow the other and, and there's going to be a problem. I feel that on many levels. And, and I think that's where, ugh, I think that's where people settle. You know, they feel that it's scarier to stand out and shine bright like they're meant to in this world. And they just kind of go, OK, I'll just kind of just dim back here and just accept, you know, the mm -hmm. norm. But, you know, I, I feel like there comes a point to where rubber meets the road. Right. And you really have to make some tough decisions on if you want to live a bigger life. I think everyone gets to it at some stage, you know, but what's hard for me to watch is when I watch so many people settle for less. They settle for lesser goals. They have no vision. They say they do, but they don't. And I read people for a living. This is what I do. When you coach somebody, you build up your intuition so strong. So if somebody doesn't have enthusiasm, there's a reason. They have no fire in them because they don't have a goal. And without a goal, nothing moves. Without a decision, nothing moves. Yet people think they're making decisions based on what they know. That's not a decision. That's a program. A decision is this is what I'm doing no matter what. And you mix discipline with it. You say, I am willing 
I don't know how I'm going to do it, but this is what I'm doing. That's a decision. It's the unknown. And the decision is always a starting point. Nothing happens without, it's not just a weak decision. It has to be an irrevocable, committed decision. A commitment is how we get started. Consistency is how we get to the finish line of our, our goals, our dreams. And then we have the next one and the mm -hmm. next one. Good formula. And that's the formula for success. I mean, in many ways, if you wrap it up in a nutshell, right? Success, I mean, it is, but success is so simple. Yeah. It is so simple, but when you're fighting yourself, it can be so difficult because you're trying to do everything. Mm -hmm. But like I said earlier, it's just a few things compounded over time. The, it's a few disciplines mixed with standards compounded over time that create absolutely enormous results. Thank you for sharing all of that. It's I'm like sweating right now because it's just like, gosh, I could talk to him all afternoon. <laughs> this is so good. What I would love to kind of go now into your um, your masterminds, and I know you guys have a lot of events throughout the year, and talk more about that because people that want to maybe get connected, I have a lot of local listeners here and people in the United States and beyond, but that would love to. I mean, we between both of us, we know tons of people that go to events mm -hmm. like this. So if you could just kind of touch on that and what those typically look like, I think you guys just had one recently last month. Uh, we correct? had our world class wealth event right. in January. We actually have another one coming up next month. Next so month. we do three to four of them a year where I get, I bring 40 people in and it's committed people. And we spend three days putting the processes, the protocols, and the mindsets in on what to do. And if you came and observed the event, you will see that. The, they keep coming back. We have so many repeat people because their results have gotten so significant. Uh, to me, if you don't have the right processes in place, you're not going to win. We have to know what those processes are. So I work deeply with them and take them from where they are to where they want to go. I teach them how to sell. I teach them leadership mindset. But by the time they leave, they have an exact process of what to do for them to really create a massive quantum leap. And then they also have each other. I mean, creating that community, to me, that would be a very powerful tool as well to have. Well, you know, it's they have each other and they connect so deeply. And it's so interesting. Day two, they're all day one. Everyone's <laughs> really locked up. But by day two, they're all open. And um, but when we come home, I do 90 days of coaching follow up once a month because accountability is a success insurance policy. How many times have we went to an event? You're like, oh, that was a good few days. And I tell everyone in the event, the work is not in here. The work is going to start when you leave this environment because you're not going to be in this environment. Uh, so uh, that's a very powerful event for anybody who wants to significantly multiply their results. I'm raising my hand because that... What you just touched on, I rarely hear that from people. Usually like, they will have an event that's exceptional, right? You, you leave, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm on fire. This is amazing. Let's go. Let's do this. And then you're right. Like it's almost like, wah, wah, wah. Mm -hmm. like then where's that next accountability partner step that's guiding you with that fire that's in your belly? That's great that you offer that. That's, I'm sure that's where most of your massive success comes from, that follow-up. Yeah, the follow-up is important because we don't want them to default back to their comfort zone. And it's very easy to do. People don't want to do it. They'll be on fire for a week. It's that second week. But with the consistent follow-up, and we give them so much material to leave. We have a daily checklist. Your productive activities, non-productive to journal them. Your three to six goal achieving activities every day. And so they're filling this out. And so the only way they're not going to succeed is if they don't do the work. Mm. Uh, and I tell them that, like, I'm very upfront about this. I'm upfront about it with all my programs. Our company motto is do the work. You do the work, the work works. And uh, because that's, it's not just this magical thing. You just hope it, you see it, and then it comes. You have to take the action. So the people that don't really step up and take this opportunity, what do you feel is what it is? I, I hate the term lazy because I don't really believe that. Do you think it's just they don't 
they're indecisive. They don't know what they want. Do you think it's just they're scared of maybe the success that awaits them? What do you think it really is that holds people back? Because when you have a proven model and proven system like you do, Mm -hmm. and you can show it, yeah. why do you think people still say no? Well, they say no because they don't believe in them. Until you believe in you and you just need an ounce. You just need that starting point. Mustard seed. You just need, yeah, you literally just need that ounce to get started. And people get activated right away when they have that. But the ones that don't, they don't bet on themselves. I was in Italy this summer and we were in Portofino, my wife and I. She was in the shower getting ready and I was sitting out on the deck looking over. It's a beautiful place. And this thought that came into my mind that said, what did you really do? And the first thought, the first answer that came in You bet on yourself. Mm. Courage is the doorway to change. And you have to bet on yourself. But who better to bet on than you? And that's what we have to do. And I have so many different elite level coaching programs because I coach people at different angles of where they are. And on all of them, I make them listen to my online coaching that's live, but I make them listen to it four times. Because you'll listen to it once, you're going to pick up 30%. Then you listen to it a second time, you'll pick up another 20. But repetition is so illogical to our programming, but we become what we repeatedly do. So we have to commit every day, two hours in a day. And that's a combination of your morning routine and studying some form. Mm -hmm. Uh, For two hours, you're going to bulletproof yourself for success. We become what we repeatedly do. Isn't that so true in either direction? either direction. Mm -hmm. I could look at it and I could be like, oh, when I was sabotaging myself, I know why. Yeah. I know why. Uh, And I know if I don't have a definite goal, that's when I drift. Mm. When I have a want, nothing, I call it a magnificent obsession. You're so in love with it. Like um, obsession, a lot of people will think obsession is a bad word. It could be if it's a bad obsession. But when it's a good obsession, It activates everything you do. And you'll know whether you have an obsession when the first thing you wake up, what are you thinking about? I'm always thinking about my goal. Mm. You know, because once I've done it long enough that I've implanted it, that's how I know when it's in my subconscious mind because it's driving all my thoughts. It's driving all my behaviors. When I start getting FOMO to something and I say no, you know, um, because a lot of people are not doing things because of fear of missing out. And you have to really lock yourself in for a period of time and commit and forget about what anybody else is going to think. You commit a year of your life, you're going to create a life of freedom. I was just going to ask you that. So what's your magical number when you do talk to people as far as really getting over their hump of Well, to create a quantum leap, you could do within three to six months if you're super locked in. But to create a permanent change... It takes a year. It takes a year to make this where it would be harder not to do than to do. So if we look at our habits, everything comes down to to habits and attitudes. Like this podcast we're doing, there's an attitude towards it. Mm -hmm. You know, people's relationship to money is an attitude. Their relationship with themselves is an attitude. Identity is an attitude. So it always comes down to attitudes and habits. But to build one habit in your identity, on average, it takes 66 days. Uh, that's on average. I've done it quicker, um, but that's average. So if we think about that, if we just focused on four identity-based behaviors, let's say one of them was doing it now. I act on everything right now. Uh, That would change somebody's life. How many people say, I'm going to do it when the time is right? I'm going to do it when the kids go to school. I'm going to do it after this project gets done. No, you lost it. You didn't seize the opportunity. Discipline would be another identity-based behavior. Living with a significant standard. Uh, Using your term 1%, which I use a lot with my clients, um, but defining that 1%. I'm going to be 1% for the next 30 days on my actions. I'm going to do 1% more bold, 1% more confident. But everything I'm going to operate with is with a swagger, with this confidence, with this dog. Mm. You know, that's Mm -hmm. that's Mm. when the life changes. So good. You're speaking to me right now because mine for this year was having tough conversations and 
having a mustard seed of courage to finally do everything that's scaring the crap out of me. Like that's really where I've dove into the last eight weeks and my world has shifted almost overnight. And not just my outer world, but my inner world more importantly, where it's now allowing me to step higher and deeper into my my purpose and passions. So it's absolutely spot on what you're saying. I mean, I feel it. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, I talk about this a lot because a lot of people will say tough conversations like you do. And I say they're just conversations. Yeah. They're only tough in your mind. Yeah. You know, people respect honesty. They, they respect transparency. So let's say you and I had a conflict. And I'd say something you did or you say something I did bothered you. I would want to squash that right away. But I would make it small in my mind, not big in my mind. A lot of people who have resistance to what they call as conf- confrontation mm-hmm. is just a conversation. But when you go out of your comfort zone, this is out of your comfort zone, I can tell, which is increasing your identity significantly. So what you're doing for yourself, you have no idea behind the scenes what you're doing um, in such a positive way. And even one positive behavior we put in ourselves, like this, having tough conversations Mm -hmm. is increasing your life. I know we're running on time, but I have to ask a few more because this is so good. And I think this is where a lot of people are feeling stuck, at least people I talk to on a daily basis. So how do you navigate that when you're having, I love your perspective on it. I've never heard it that way, but how do you navigate it when the tough conversation is because of how the other person reacts and doesn't, you know, calmly respond when bringing those up? That's where, Mm -hmm. so that fear is valid because of the reaction they're going to receive from bringing up A, B, and C tough conversation. But that's none of your business. Your business is to put out, to step into your power. Mm-hmm. And it's just feedback. If they react, that's their, that's their right. shit. So the thing is, we can't be attached to the outside world. See, every day I have these three ideas that I bulletproof myself. I told you earlier, we have to conquer ourselves. So the first thing I ask myself is, do I have a goal that inspires me? I'll be like, yes, I built that goal. I really want it. Number two is always outside conditions and circumstances. I cannot let the outside disturb me. If I do, I'm giving away all my power to the outside. And number three, I have to listen to understand. But when I say listen to understand, listening to myself, the conversations I'm having with myself are going to show me. And all of us, I'm at the top of the list here. Our biggest obstacle every day is our present results. If we let our present results say, oh, I got to be careful because I didn't have my best month. You just lost. You can't let your present results control you. Everything has to be dictated by your future self. How Mm. would your future self respond to this? The person who achieved all that you're going to achieve this year, December 31st or sooner. And every answer should be coming from that person, not who you are right now. Mm. We're not the same person as our future self. Look at who you were two years ago. Are you the same person? Not even close. So a lot of people try to connect the future self to who they are today. It's a completely different version. It's a much elevated version. It's a much more aware version of themselves. So don't let the outside control you. Now, that takes a lot of mastery. That takes a ton of mastery. I remember... um, I was working with my mentor and we were working together. This was several years ago. And he, I said, I'm stuck. And he said, well, why are you stuck? I said, because I'm letting the outside control me. And I said, I know what you're going to say. It's my attitude. <laughs> and he said, it is. And I knew it because I'd be really high when things were going good, but I'd be just as low when things weren't going well. And he said to me, I'm going to give you a lesson that my mentor taught me. And he said, a true professional in life has an even better attitude when they're facing adversity. He said, it's easy to have a great attitude when things are going well, but the ones who have an even better attitude when they're not are the ones that win. And I went on a two-year ride on attitude. I mean, I studied (laughs) attitude so deeply because I was like, where do I have a good attitude? When do I not? So I, I reflect everything to attitude. Like you have a bad attitude, bad result. Because our attitude is our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. They're not just our thoughts. It's connected with a feeling and the actions we take. That's how you create results. I want to just like 
all afternoon have conversation. Like, <laughs> this is so good, Arash. This is so good. And I would love to have you back on the podcast in the event that you have some time in the future. Oh, definitely. Because this is all amazing. I do want to just remind everybody the world class wealth mindset, four pillars to building personal freedom is available mm -hmm. right now for pre order. And I want to wrap it up with a speed round if you're okay with it. Sure. All right. We have some questions here that he has no idea what they are. So I uh, named this speed round Getting Activated with Arash. And I think uh -huh. it couldn't be closer to the truth because you definitely know how to activate people. So are you ready? I'm ready. All right. What was your very first job? I worked at Express. It, um, I was a um, stock boy. Wow, I would never have thought that. What books have shaped your career the most? Science of Getting Rich is my favorite book of all time. Another one was Psycho Cybernetics. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, if anyone's listening and wants to improve their self image, I'd start with Psycho Cybernetics. I started reading that, I haven't finished it. So, good reminder. Who has made the most influence in your life? Oh, um, professionally. Bob Proctor, no question. Personally, my family and my wife and kids. Hmm. I'm going to cry right now. <laughs> <laughs> what is the hardest challenge you've had to overcome? Oh, that's a good one. I think the hardest one that I had to overcome was when my mom was nearing the end and she got onset of Alzheimer's. It was probably the hardest thing I've always faced challenges and I wanted to run. Uh, so I could tell you, I didn't run, but that's like the emotional feeling. So that was probably the hardest one. And rightfully so. What is the most embarrassing moment of your life so far? <laughs> <laughs> I was in college and I was vis visiting friends in Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, if anyone knows it. And I had to, we were out at the bars and I had to go to the bathroom. There was no stall. <laughs> and I had to go number two. <laughs> and anyhow, there, then I had a friend come and he just put his hands out to guard it, right? There's no toilet paper. And the guy who ended up giving me the toilet paper, it was right when UFC started with Ken Shamrock. So if anybody knows who he is, that was... That would be it. Oh my, that's probably one <laughs> yeah. of the best yeah. embarrassing moments you could ever have wished for. Yeah. In such a weird, fun way. What is your proudest accomplishment? Uh, being a father is by far my most proud accomplishment. So good. What's one idea that you think the majority of people get wrong? Service. They don't know how to serve. They serve oh. conditionally. Your ability to improve your service will skyrocket your income. And a lot of people think they're great givers and they're very conditional. You know you're a great giver where you want nothing in return. That's gonna be the highlight, mm. one of the highlights. What is one of the best or most worthwhile investments you've ever made? It could be an investment of time, money, or energy. Mine for sure was mentorship. I don't know where my life would be. Um, and it's key to get the right mentor. So you always want to measure it against somebody that's already performing the results that you want to perform. And I always ask, I always tell people, never listen to people unless you want to switch spots with them. It's mm. great mm. advice. What can people expect from you next? Big things. Big things. We, we're, we're building so fast. I mean, what I'm most grateful for is we're constantly adding new programs to help people. I'm always wanting to make it more simple for people. Uh, like just in this year, we created six elite level coaching programs and the client's results have been incredible, but I'm always thinking of how can I help better? Mm. If I don't get one person that can do it, I'm like, why not? Like I wanna make it so they can do it. So I will tell you, I feel like, I always feel like this, I'm just getting started. Mm. And that level of service and integrity is why you are doing such great yeah. things. Thank you. And last one, what is one final thought you would want to leave our listeners with? I'll give you this one. And it was one when I was struggling is what you think you can accomplish is not even close to what you can accomplish. When you make a decision to bet on yourself, 
you're putting everything in front of you, setting you up to win. But until you make that decision to dream more, like really spend time thinking, how do I want to live? I was in a, I was in a seminar one day and I was in the front and I was super shy, insecure. And I remember my mentor said, he said, all you guys are going to leave and only 3% of you are going to do the work. And he said, make sure you make the decision you're one of the 3%. And I remember sitting there, I said, I'm gonna do it. Mm-hmm. I, even though I didn't believe it, that's what I said to myself, but I honored that. So when we hold firm to a big dream, it activates something in us. And if you don't have passion right now, you're just drifting. You've gotta, you've gotta lock in on how you wanna live. Forget about the money, forget about fame, forget about any of that. It's how do I wanna spend my days? And that's what I would recommend. Mm, And freedom is the goal. Freedom, there's nothing better. But you know what I found out about freedom? Going back to my story when I lost my job, I had no money at the time, very little money. And I had never felt more free at that time in my life. And I realized freedom was not financial. It was emotional. Where you're doing what you love. I think that's the key. If you do what you love and love what you do, you will put time in getting better at your ability to do it and the money will follow. Mm, So good. And I love what I do and I love having you here. You guys have taken Mm -hmm. the time. Veronica, your wife is absolutely amazing. I'm just so grateful for all of you and you being here and giving such wealth of information, Mm. not just the wealth of mindset, the wealth of information you've poured out and poured into everybody is just is exceptional. So thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. I look forward to coming back. Oh, I can't wait. And then where can people connect with you on? I know you're on Instagram. I'm on Instagram. They could follow my seven figure podcast. Um, they can go to my website. Uh, it's www.bosscoachingco.com. Okay. I'm very, one of the things that I, I really make it a point, I'm not an arm's distance away from my clients. I work closely with them. You can email me at hello at Boss Coaching Co. as well. And I always get back to you. I love it. And I'll have all those in the show notes. Everybody can easily access, you know, grab it, just click and go. You know, I always got your back. I Mm -hmm. never make it hard for anybody. So we'll have all that dialed in. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Make it a great day. Beautiful day. Prosperous Mm -hmm. day.